Last week, um, Senator John McCain, a senator from Arizona, uh, was, was diagnosed with a stage four brain cancer. It's the most, uh, most aggressive kind of brain cancer uh, that we know of. And typically, people who, who are diagnosed with that, they, they have died within a year to a year and a half of, of being diagnosed. And so they found it when they were, they were uh, if you're in the news, you know all this, they, they were removing a blood clot from behind his eye and then and, you know, found the tumor. And uh, he, re he recovered from his surgery for a couple of days and then returned back to Washington. And I believe it was on Tuesday. And it, it was like a, it was a hero's welcome. I mean, you know, the, Sen the Democratic senators, the Republican senators, they were all just welcoming him and, and, and praising him and, and talking about how, what, what an American hero that he is. He, he has a real, a real back story. He, he was a Viet Vietnam, uh, uh, I believe, fighter pilot, shot down in a, in a Viet Cong prison camp for like five years or so. And uh, was tortured and refused to be released before his comrades comrades could be released even though he had a chance to do so and and just a, just an amazing story there and so whatever he happened to do in his, in his political career that 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 background that he has is, is something that people always really think of but so they were you know praising him as an you know, American hero and all that kind of stuff well then he gets onto the Senate floor and gives this speech that is basically the biggest bipartisan spanking that I've heard, politically speaking, uh, in, in, a, in a very long time. And he, he criticized the, the Democrats when they were in power about how they used their power and abused their power and didn't go through the, the, the proper process of making laws for the American people. And then he, he, he railed on the Republicans who are now in power and saying, you are doing the exact same thing and abusing your power and not, not working with the Democrats. No. And, and, and he, just, he just let them all have it, basically. Um, and then over the course of that week, proceeded to cast votes that made essentially everybody angry. The, the, the liberals were angry at him for a vote, vote that he cast earlier in the week. They were furious at him. The conservatives were furious at him for a vote that he cast later in the week. So all of a sudden, the, 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 the narrative turned from American hero to can't stand this guy. And that was almost, almost everybody. And uh, whether you're not, you are, you know, whatever p political persuasion you are, that's this not, 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 not about that. Uh, what, uh, what got me is uh, he, was, he was leaving the Capitol after casting one of these controversial votes, and a reporter asked him, he said, why did you vote no? And he said, because it was the right vote. And I thought, and I can't know his motivation, I don't know what's going on in his head, but I thought, you know, Here's a man that knows that his time is short, that he doesn't have a whole lot left, most likely, uh, in his life. And the things that he is most proud of in his life are those times when he did what he knew, what was right, whatever the consequence. And I think he just wants to go out doing what he thinks is right, whatever the consequence. And... Uh, as I was simultaneous through the week, as I was studying 1 John, I, I saw the Apostle John in somewhat of a, of a similar light. John, he's getting to be an old man. He's writing this, this letter to some Christians, probably toward the end of his life. And these Christians are having these problems. They're, they're having these, these issues, and, 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 and things are in some ways not going well. And, you know, John is just not worried about offending them. He's just not, he doesn't tiptoe around the issue. He doesn't, you know, kind of come in softly and try to, you know, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to, you know, you know. Man, he just, he just lets them know how it is. And it's blunt, almost brutally blunt. And as we've been, as we've been studying this through this book ourselves, wait, wait, good chances you've been kind of, kind of hit by it. Because, you know, he's just going to, tell you like it is and not worry about you being offended by it. And so he does. And John essentially says, look, it is very, very possible to think you are a Christian, to think you are in the light, as he says, someone who is in God's light, in, in God's care, in a child of God. It's possible to think you are a Christian and be totally deceived. And he gives these 
these three um, evidences of how to know whether or not you truly, really are a for real Christian. And, and one of those he gives is if you don't just hear what Jesus says, but you actually put it into practice, that you actually do what Jesus says. A lot of times we think, you know, go to church, do Bible class, do Bible studies, and I hear a lot of what I should do. I'll even talk about a lot of what I should do, but I don't actually do it. And, and John says, look, if you're not actually putting it into practice, not that you're going to do it perfectly, but if you're not actually putting into practice what you've learned, you're deceived. You're not truly in the light. You're still walking around in darkness. And the second evidence he gives is really kind of an extension of the first and says the main, the, the central, central command that Jesus gives, all the others are important, but this one kind of, kind of takes care of all of them, is that you love your brother, your sister in Christ. Now, of course, we're supposed to love all people, love the lost and all that kind of, but John, he focuses in on that you love one another. And, and if you hate, if you despise, if you have dismissed and pushed away, if you have wished harm on another believer, he says, you're groping around in darkness. You think you're in the light. No, no. Hate simply will not coexist with God's light. He gives another evidence later on, and we'll, we'll get to that later. But it's a very good chance that you, you hear those things and, 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 it, and it causes you to cause you to reevaluate, cause you to question. Because you know what what is this for real with me? And, and John very much intends for his readers to, to ask those questions. He he doesn't care if they get offended. He, does, he I mean he wants you to ask those questions. Am I for real? Is the is the what's coming out of my life evidence that God is in my life? that God is in control of my life. Well, as we've, uh, as we've looked at this, it kind of seems like John's trying to beat us up a little bit. It kind of seems like he's trying to, you know, and, and, and for sure he wants us to question. But John's purpose, his ultimate purpose, is not to make us feel bad, is not to get us to doubt our salvation. It is to get us to realize where salvation really comes from. It's what gets really what it is, what it is made of, to open to our, our eyes to where salvation is really found. If we are condemned by the tests that he has given us so far, then the solution is not just to start okay, you know, I haven't been doing what Jesus says to do. Okay, I need to start doing what's right, and I start, need to start being nice to people. I need to do what's right, and I need to be nice to people. That's not what John's saying, because that's simply religion. Practically every religion in the world says, do right, be nice to people. Do right, be nice to people. And that's, that's pretty, pretty general. Christianity is much, is much deeper than that. It goes to a there's, a, there's a core, there's a driving force behind that in Christianity. And, and, and it is this. Our central problem is not a behavior issue. It's not even an attitude issue. Uh, Christianity... I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Our central problem is not a behavior issue or even an attitude issue. Our wrong attitudes and our wrong behaviors are symptoms of a deeper problem. Have you, have you ever tried to, to treat symptoms when, when there was a deeper problem going on? Uh, several months ago, I know years ago, Ben and Hope were both having just uh, really rough allergy problems. And really, most of the year, they were having to take Zyrtec every morning, every night, you know, and we got to where, well, Hope just took a turn for the worse. She was about uh, three years old or so, and she just started getting really bad. And, and she couldn't, couldn't breathe at night good, and we were giving her Benadryl. I was like, we can't just keep getting on Benadryl every single night. And it's going, so finally we took her to the doctor, and they, they did a blood test, and they discovered she was allergic to wheat and milk and eggs, among other things. So, you know, a lot of things are made out of 
wheat and milk and eggs. You know, it's a little bit difficult to avoid those things, but that, that's what we, okay, we've got to keep her off of milk and wheat and eggs and some other things. And so we started giving her a diet free of that stuff, or nearly free of that stuff. And she got better. She got better. No more Zyrtec. No more Benadryl. You know, we weren't, all of a sudden, the, the core problem, the core issue was getting better. Fortunately, she's kind of grown out of that mostly, so she's not, not so bad as far as that goes. But when you try to treat symptoms without dealing with the core issue, because that, that's, what, that's what I do so much, even, even in teaching. I'll give lessons on, you know, loving people, on uh, having a pure, pure thoughts, avoiding sexual temptation, avoiding, avoiding uh, anger and, and, and various you know, different kind of things that we do bad. You know, don't do this, don't do that, but do this and do that. A lot of which is simply the symptoms of a core issue, of a central issue. And John today, th- this to me is, is I'm, I'm, I'm excited, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous, I'm excited about today because I realize today that John is going to take us to the core issue. He's going to take us to, to help us understand, hey, what is really the source of my problems? What is really the source of the life that God wants to give me? Where, where is it at? So he's going to get us there. John's going to kind of take us to the core. And, and we're, going to, we're going to pick up kind of where we left off last week uh, to get us there. This is what John says. Chapter 3, verse 11 through 15. This is a letter that he's writing to Christians. He says, For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. So here we have the command, love each other. Okay? There's the command. There's what we're supposed to do. Now, we might ask, what does this love look like? Okay? What does it look like when I love uh, other believers in in particular? Well, the next verse, he tells us, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Jesus showed us what love is. He laid down his comfort and his desires for me, for you. He laid down his pride, his reputation, so that you and I might benefit. What's love? Jesus laid down his life for the people who spit in his face. Jesus laid down his life for the people who were mocking him, stripping him, and utterly humiliating him. Jesus laid down his life for the people who literally drove nails through his body. That's it. That's what love is. Go and do that. Go and do that. Go and lay down your life for your brother, for your sister. That seems so unattainable. That seems so unattainable. I mean, it's like, okay, yeah, that's good. We should love each other. I have trouble. I, I have trouble laying down my life for somebody who likes me, for somebody who loves me, for me to lay down my life for them. How much about lay down my life for people who don't even, even like me? Don't even want me. I, this idea of, of giving myself up for someone who, who can't stand me, who works against me, who, who disagrees with me and who's in the way of me getting what I want, who, who's standing and, and blocking what, what I want to... Someone who's trying to harm me, who really wishes ill on me. See, I have never experienced anywhere close to the kind of thing that Jesus experienced. I, I haven't, I don't know what it's like to have people who want me dead. I, I don't know what that's, I don't know what that's like. A few, few of you might know what that's like. I have people who would just rather you be dead than alive. And so, 
how, how if I can't even, if I struggle to even love those who love me, how could I ever love like Jesus loved? It seems, it seems almost inhuman to be able to love that way, and, and in a sense, it is. So how can we be expected to love like that? Most of us, most of us say, well, pfft, it's impossible for me. Somebody might be able to do it, but I can't do it. So I'm just going to do the best I can. I'm just going to get on with, you know, just do the best I can with, you know, I, I can't love like that. Did, did, God, did God tell us to do that simply to show us how lousy we are? Did, did he say, this is the way I want you to love, just to help you know how much a fail you, you're, you, know, you are at life? I mean, is, is, is it just, is that the purpose? It can't be. It can't be. Surely, surely God actually intends for the love that Jesus has to be inside of me. Surely God intends for me to truly, actually love that way. He says it over and over and over. He can't be just, he must mean it. Well, if he means it, how does it happen? Because it, does, it seems so, so inaccessible. It, it seems so, so impossible to us to love that way. How can we experience this love? Where does it come from? How do we obtain it? How does it become ours how do we get to the source? How do we stop just treating the symptoms of our lack of love and address the problem itself? And that is what John tries to do in chapter 4. Let's, let's look. We're going to be in uh, chapter 4, verse, starting verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, here, here John tells us to love based on the grounds of who God is. That God at his very core of his character loves. He even says that God is love. Not, God's not a feeling, okay? But love is such a core characteristic of who He is. It comes from Him. All love comes from Him. How could that be? I'm going to speculate just a little bit. I mean, I have some foundation for this, but, but there's some speculation involved in this as well. Um, one of the weirdest Christian beliefs uh, if, if you're not a Christian, if, if, you, if you, you know, just checking this kind of stuff out, one of the strangest Christian beliefs you've probably heard is the, the idea of the Trinity. And that is this. Christians believe, the Bible teaches us, that there is one God. There is one God. There's not a bunch of gods. It's not paganism. There is one God. But that this one God is Father. There's the Father God. But there's also God the Son who is fully God, and yet who became fully human, and yet still is yet, he is truly and fully God. And then there is God the Spirit, that is also fully God, but yet functions in a different way and actually functions and serves the Father. And Jesus talks about this, of how the Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. We've got the Father and the Son and the Spirit who love one another, who are sacrificially giving toward one another, that within God Himself, there is relationship. Now that doesn't make any sense, okay? I'm going to confess right now, that's, in our deal, that's illogical. That doesn't... But if you believe that there's a God you realize that God exists in a dimension beyond the dimension that we are confined to. And that there is going to be a lot of stuff about God that we cannot wrap our minds around. That there are, there are things about God that, wait, I'm sorry, we just we can't make sense of, and so we, we should expect that. So if you, can, if you can buy the fact that God is three persons and yet one God, you can begin to see 
how God in His very nature, in His very His core makeup, is love. You know, if, if, he, if God wasn't multiple persons within Himself, I'm not sure that He could actually love. At least, I mean, he would ha- you have to love somebody. For the love to be love, you have to love somebody, right? So God would have had to create beings for him to love in order for, him to, you know, for that to happen. Him and his core, his core self, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be true. So, uh, whether you buy that, that's because some of that speculation or not, the point is, is that God, at his very core, very who he is, he loves, and he is the source of love, and he is the one who enables us to love. So let's continue. Continuing in verse 9. Brandon read these verses just a moment ago, a couple of them anyway. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God. Get this, okay? Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God has so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and His love is made complete in us. Skip on down to verse 16. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. How do we do this seemingly impossible thing called love? How can the love that Jesus has for those who hurt him become the love that we have for our Christian family and ultimately for the world? Here's how it happens. We come to know and rely on the love God has for us. How is it possible for me to actually lay down my life for you, for those who want to hurt me? And the answer is this. For me to know, to trust in the love that God has for me. I have a question for you. Do you, in the, in the core of who you are, from the inside out, do you believe that God is fully and deeply in love with you? Do you, with, with every fiber of your being, do you know that God loves you? Not simply the world, that God loves you. I know a lot of you have been to church almost all your life, perhaps all your life. You may have been taught as you were a kid growing up, God loves you, God loves you. You saying Jesus loves me a thousand times. But do you believe that? Do you believe that? I have to to confess to you that I have spent much of my life not really believing that God loves me. Apart from what I might do for Him, apart from the characteristics that I might have, apart from my hard work, apart from all of that, that God loves me. But he is crazy about me. 
And my lack of belief in His love has shown up in, in so much of my, my life. Following Jesus. And so many times in my life, following Jesus has become a job. I, it's the burden. Something that I, I'm going to do this. I'm gonna do, and I'm going you know, to do this. You know, I'm going to prove myself to God. God, I'm going to prove myself somehow that I, I am serious about this, that I'm worthy of this, that, that I'm... Because I'm not sure that He loves me as I am. My lack of knowing Him has shown up in my relationship with God. You know, you know when there's something, somebody who's important to you, whom you know loves you as you are, you are drawn to that person. You, you enjoy being with that person. I mean, that's just some, somebody you want to share life with. And you know, for much of my life, spending time alone with God was something that I needed to do. I need to do that. But not necessarily something I, I wanted to do. And I realize that the core problem, what was going on in me, is that I, I didn't just know that God fully, completely, and deeply loved me. It's shown in my hesitation to talk about God outside of church. You know, I, it's amazing how terrified that I can be when I, you know, I have an opportunity to, to, to be with maybe an unbeliever or somebody that I don't know if they, they believe or not, and to talk about God, talk about my faith, and somehow bring that into the conversation. It's just terrifying to me. Why is that so scary? Because you know, you're not afraid to talk about somebody that you're in love with. My fear was pointing toward a deeper problem that I still didn't fully understand how much God loves me. My relationships have often been hindered because I, I would bring expectations to those who I loved, and if they didn't perform to those expectations, I back off, I would withdraw from them. I would try to protect myself. I don't want to hurt, not allow myself to get too close to people, too emotionally attached to people because I need to protect myself because I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to be rejected. I'm insecure. Why? Because I haven't fully come to know and rely on the love that God has for me. I still depend on others to tell me who I am rather than my Creator. So my, my first and foremost desire that comes out of a study of 1 John is, a, is in some sense a selfish one. I want to know more deeply, more fully, more completely the love that God has for me. I want to live. I, I, want the, I want the fearful, protective layers that are surrounding my heart that keep, that keep God's love from penetrating deeper. I want those protective layers torn apart, torn away, and so that God can enter those places in my heart that He's, he's really already there, but that I haven't let, I haven't acknowledged His presence there because I was protecting my heart from the only one who could heal it. See, I want to live out of the overflow of love for God and not out of fear. My next desire is for you. It's for you to experience and to know the love that God has for you. You may think you have a problem with worry. You may think you have a problem uh, with, with your temper, with your speech, or with sexual temptation. You may think you have a, have a problem with relationships. But all those things are just symptoms. The real problem is that God has poured out His love onto your heart, but you have covered it up. 
so that it cannot penetrate into you. You've protected your heart from the one person who can save it. So this morning, I believe God's desire for each one of us is that we begin to peel back those protective layers of fear that keep us from knowing the love that God has for us and the love that He's had for us all along. To help us do that, I'm going to just share with you a, a, a brief prayer that, that Paul prayed uh, in his book that he wrote to, to the church in Ephesus in, in the letter we call Ephesians. And this was his prayer for these Christians. He said, For this reason I kneel, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of His glorious riches He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul prays, I want you to know something that is beyond knowing. I want you to experience something that you you cannot make happen. You cannot do something. You cannot make this. You cannot force this. It is something only God can do. You can't know the love of God by hearing it. By hearing it it said, God loves you. You can't know the love of God by teaching, by saying, God loves you. God loves me. You can only know the love of God when God gives it to you. When God makes you able to receive it. We're completely upon Him to reveal it to us. And He wants to. But He won't do it against our will. He won't won't do it without our desire to receive it. Paul said he prayed this prayer kneeling before the Father. I just want to invite you to spend just a little time in prayer. And to ask God, if you desire to, to ask God to reveal to you how much He loves you. To help you to know and be able to trust in that love. And uh, if, if, you feel, if you feel comfortable uh, doing so, Ed, would you kill the other lights? Would you do if you, uh, if you feel comfortable just doing so, don't feel compelled at all. I uh, invite you to, to join me in, in just in kneeling, physically kneeling before the Father as, as, we, as we ask Him, as we invite Him to show us, to begin to reveal to us how much He loves us. I'm going to play a song and just to, to help us uh, get rid of the distractions and to, Maybe also to help us know that love at a little deeper level. But we're just going to spend a few moments in prayer.